Oh, too kind. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Let's give God some praise. God is amazing. And thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And you guys can take your seats. So nice being with you today. How's your year going so far? We're having a good year so far? I work as a grade two teacher and this past week was the week we went back to school. And it was like a shock to my system, waking up early again, getting back into the groove of things. Anyone have kids at home? You had to get them up, out of bed, ready for school. I'm sure that was fun times this week. Um, but the uh, other teacher who teaches grade two, whose classroom is right next to mine, uh, without fail, she'll always have some kind of countdown on her board. And so I went in and sure enough, 40 days until March break. So, so thankful for that. Now it must be 39. So, you know, teaching is kind of a marathon. So you need those little breaks, something to say, okay, I can do the next leg of the journey and then, and then there's a break. But uh, I do love my job. I love teaching. And it is a privilege to be able to teach here at our church and, and preach uh, this morning. And I'm excited to come around God's word. We're actually going to be starting a new series, and it's all about the gospel, the power and the beauty of the gospel. And the gospel means good news. That's what it means, good news. And it's often encapsulated in John 3.16, that verse. And they're going to put it up on the screen. You can say it with me. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Powerful. But why is the gospel good news? Like what makes it so good? Sometimes we can be really familiar with that verse or maybe the story of the gospel you've heard before, and we just forget how absolutely wonderful the gospel is. Or maybe for others in this room or those of you listening at home online, welcome to you. You know, you've, you've heard it before, but you're still searching. You, you don't really know if you believe it. You're not sure you understand it. Or you don't even know if it's really good news. We use the term good news in our culture, you know, when we want to share something happy that's happening, something that's really exciting in our lives. Even when we did the praise reports, right? We're sharing the good news. Maybe you talk to someone and, you know, and they tell you they've got good news. They just bought a house or they're graduating college or they've got a new job. And while these things are great and they're to be celebrated, you know, they're only temporary changes or accomplishments in life. The good news of the gospel is news that not only impacts here and now, but it impacts all of eternity. It's news that goes on forever and ever. It impacts your eternity. So the good news of the gospel is unlike any other good news that you're going to hear in your life because it's actually the best news <laughs> that you're ever going to hear in your entire life. And so over these next few weeks, we are going to be diving into why exactly it is good news and why we can be so excited about it as Christians. And, you know, there are several reasons for why the gospel is good news. But today we're going to explore one main thought. Okay, one main thought about why the gospel is good news, and it's this. The gospel is good news because it means that your life is not an accident. God loves you, and you were made with a plan and a purpose in mind. The gospel shows that to us. And if you're looking for a title for this message, it is Made for a purpose, made for a purpose. So church, those of you online and, and here in the room, let's pray together as we get started. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is precious, it's a treasure, it's beautiful, God. We honor it in this place. And Lord, we thank you for the gospel, that good news that fills our hearts with so much hope, Lord. God, would you give us a deeper revelation of your good news today? Would you show us just how wonderful, beautiful, amazing it is and alive in our hearts to the truth of your word? And all God's people said, yes. amen, amen. Well, at some point in your life, maybe you can relate, most people will come to ask that classic existential question, why am I here on earth? Anybody ever ask that question? Why am I here on earth? Maybe you're answering it, asking that today, I don't know. You know, it's an important question to ask 
but it's also an important question to find the correct answer to. Okay, there's a lot of answers in the world about why you're here. You want to find the right one. And you're in the right place today to hear about why you're here. Okay? And I remember wrestling with that question specifically around the age of 18. Okay? I was in my first year of university. I was trying to find my way through life. There was a death in my family. And I really just started to question the meaning of life. I was determined to find an answer. Like, I wanted to know the truth. And I wondered, is life really just an accident? I don't know. Am I, am I just here by random chance? And if so, then like, what's the point? Am I just supposed to follow what everybody else does? Do I go to school and then I get a job, make some money, maybe I get married, maybe have a family, retire on a beach, and then die? Like, is that that's the progression of how life's supposed to go? And, and that's just kind of it. And then when you die, that's it? You just That's your one chance? Maybe, maybe it's just an accident. I was hearing that from some people. Uh, I was also hearing maybe my life is reincarnated. Like maybe I had other lives before this life and here's another chance and then I got to do really good in this life so I come back in a higher form in the next life. Is, is that it? Like am I just living another life? I'm going around again? Or maybe there's, maybe there's no answer. Like maybe it's just that question with no answer. We have to go to in, about our lives in the dark about why we exist, and people just kind of shrug their shoulders and kind of laugh and poke fun, like, I don't know what the meaning of life is. Do you know? I don't know. It seemed to me there was a lot of confusing and conflicting ideas out there, and I really wanted to know the truth. And through my investigation, time and time again, I was drawn to the Bible. I was drawn to the Bible. It was the only place I found an answer to the question that filled my heart with hope. In fact, I remember being 18 and on, on the floor of my bedroom and just crying out to God and saying, God, if you're real, show me. Show me who you are. I'm desperate to know, are you there? I'm really lost. I don't know what I'm doing in life. And actually, shortly after that, a friend of mine invited me to her church, and I started to go and think, oh, Okay, some of the pieces are, are falling into place now. Because every other explanation from other sources left me hopeless and confused. But the explanation offered in God's word brought clarity, understanding, and revelation to my soul. And you know, specifically the gospel, the good news that Jesus shares about salvation makes it clear that our lives are extremely valuable to God. And there is a divine purpose connected to our existence. We're not here by accident. So what is the answer the Bible offers to the question, why am I here on earth? And specifically, how does the gospel point us to answers about the purpose of our life? Well, first, we really need to understand what the gospel is. We're going to start here. Like, what actually essentially is the gospel? And we could spend a lot of time here talking about what it is and the story of the gospel, but I'm going to give it to you in a bit of a nutshell, okay? And if you're familiar with it, I'm really praying you have ears to hear it fresh this morning because it is one of those stories you can go, yep, yeah, I know that. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Hear it afresh today as we listen to it together. It's really amazing. So if you were to understand the gospel in a nutshell, it would be this, okay? God created the world. There is a creator. He created the world, every living thing. And when he made it, he looked at it and said, this is so good. <laughs> he was excited about it. He said, this place is awesome. This is a good place. And God created, you know, every living thing, humans. He did not create robots. He did not create robots programmed to comply and love him. But instead, he created humans with a free will. Okay, he gave humans a choice to love and obey him or hate and reject him. Because love really is a choice. It, it is a choice. And the first two humans, Adam and Eve, chose to disobey God and rebel against him. Sin entered the world, and this caused brokenness in the souls of humanity and separation from a holy, perfect, sinless God for all eternity. An eternal God. We're separated from him for all eternity, right? Now, God is God, okay? He's the one in charge. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. He calls the shots. He could have just left it there, left us to suffer the consequences of our wrongdoing. 
But we know from the Bible the character and the nature of God. The Bible says that God is merciful and he is compassionate. And he loves those he created with an everlasting love. And, you know, he promised to send someone to rescue humanity and set them free from their sin. Okay, so we've got God created the world, sin entered the world, and then entered Jesus, the perfect one. Okay, he came to rescue us from our sins. God came to earth in the form of a baby. I know it's hard to imagine. If we could totally understand it, then we could put God in a box. But it's, it's beyond our understanding even. But in its simplest explanation, God came to earth in the form of a baby, grew up, taught people about the truth of his holy kingdom. He was fully human. He was fully man. But at the same time, he was fully God. And he was absolutely without sin his whole life. You know, some people loved him. Some people hated him. And those who hated him sent him to the cross to be crucified. And on the cross, God paid the penalty for our sin. Every single sin, past, present, future, every sin paid for on the cross. And through his sacrifice, he made a way for people to be put back into right relationship with him through the forgiveness of their sins. Back to how it was at the beginning, how it was supposed to be before sin entered the scene. And you know, when we repent from our sins, when we turn away from our sins, we are forgiven. We are saved when we place our faith in Jesus. We're saved from a, living a life steeped in sin here on earth, but we're also saved from living in eternity separated from God, facing the penalty for all the wrong that we've done. And now, if you think you are a good person, on your own and don't need God's salvation, well, it won't sound like good news to you. It won't. Say, well, I'm doing okay in life on my own. I'm trying to make good choices. I'm, I'm a good person. I don't need salvation. That doesn't sound like good news, right? But if you have eyes to see and a soft heart to receive the truth that you desperately need the grace of God and are absolutely lost and wrecked without him, then that's when the good news starts to come alive in your heart. And, you know, it's not a coincidence when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You read through them. It's not a coincidence that those who responded to Jesus' message of the Gospel were the prostitutes and social outcasts. And those who were offended by it were the pious religious leaders who thought they were good people apart from God's salvation. And you know, this gospel story has endured through generations and will endure until Jesus returns. And he promised he will, and God's word does not fail. He will come again. But we need to choose how we respond, if we're going to believe it or not. That's up to us, okay? So there we go. There's the gospel in its simplest form, in a nutshell there. Try to, keep, kind of try to condense it. But, but let's return now to this question why are we here on earth? And how does that story that I just shared, how does that give us an answer? How does the gospel point us to the purpose of why we're here? Well, we're going to explore three truths that are woven into the gospel that can give us hope and purpose and cause our hearts to rejoice in this good news. Are you ready, church? The first one is this. The first amazing truth that's revealed in the gospel is this. The gospel reveals that our lives are not an accident. I've already mentioned that. But this is the first point. Our lives are not an accident. That's really important. Because, you know, have you ever read or tried reading through the genealogies in the Bible? <laughs> you ever tried that? You know, you fumble your way through names that sound like tongue twisters. And you get lost in, like, who begat who. Three lines down, you're like, I'm just going to skim over that and kind of move over somewhere else. You know, scripture like, for example, here on the screen, Matthew 1.3. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar Perez and the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. And just keeps going. You know, it's not as quotable or as memorable as like a Jeremiah 29.11. I don't see many people with like scriptures of genealogies in their house. Usually you see like, you know, be still and know that I'm God. On the wall, But, you know, even though it can be more challenging to read through the genealogies, it's in God's word for a reason. And it actually points to something really remarkable. Okay, it points to the truth that there is a creator of life 
who is in the details of the times and places that people are born. He is orchestrating people coming together, forming families, generation after generation to accomplish his plans and his purposes. And you know, if you keep reading through the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, you see that God himself, the creator of the universe, writes himself into the lineage of humanity. That's like the author writing himself into his own story. Okay? In verse 16, it finishes off the genealogy stating, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. In fact, Jesus is also called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He lived here on earth, God in human flesh. And, you know, if God orchestrated all of those people in history to be born through generations, don't you think he's doing the same thing today? You know, it's not like he's abdicated his throne, given up his sovereignty and divine plan for humanity, stopped at Jesus, and then that's it. You know, he's an amazing creator. He plans everything out with such detail and intention, like an artist working on a masterpiece. Think about this in, in Ephesians 2.10 in the NLT version. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, if there is no creator who designed and handcrafted this earth and each human being, then there is no gospel. There would be no good news. We would just be a random collection of cells here for a time, no significance, no purpose, just here by chance in some cosmic lottery. Thank goodness that is not true. Thank goodness that is not true. There is a creator and therefore there is very good news. Your life has meaning. Your life was created with intentionality. You were purposed to be here on earth, to be loved by God and experience the miracle of being alive on this tiny dot called earth against this expensive, expansive backdrop of the universe that goes on and on forever. No one knows the beginning or the end of it, except God, who is the beginning and the end. You know, life is an absolute miracle. The fact that you're in this room right now is nothing short of miraculous. You know, just consider all the generations of people who had to go before you in order for you to be here today. Consider all the details that needed to be put into place so that you would be born. All the circumstances, all the different people meeting, families forming through history. In chapter 17 of the book of Acts, the apostle Paul is in Athens. And he's sharing the good news about Jesus. And he notices all the idols of gold and stone. And it grieves his heart. It saddens his heart. And there's an altar he notices with an inscription to an unknown God. And so he says to the people, well, I can tell you who God is. He's, he's not unknown. You can know him. And he says this, in, starting in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life to everyone or gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and histories and the boundary of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. And find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. How incredible that God can be known. He can be known. He's revealed himself to us. He gives us life and breath. He decides when we're going to be born. The perfect time for us to enter into the story of humanity. And consider for a moment not only God's sovereignty in designing you, but just how amazing you are made. If you, science is incredible. Science points to God. Science shows us just the incredible intricacies of this world and of our human body. I saw some of these facts, and they amaze me. The human body is made up of 30 trillion cells. One human body. I can't even, that's a big number. 30 trillion cells, and if you laid them end to end, you could wrap the cells of your body around the world over 13 times. Just the cells in your body, one body sitting in this room, 
your cells could wrap around the world over 13 times. Information is sent along your nerves at 400 kilometers per hour. The human heart will be over 300 billion times in an average lifespan. And there is no one like you who has ever lived or will ever live. You are absolutely unique. You have a unique fingerprint, tongue print, unique speaking voice. God has handcrafted you. Listen to this in Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows you. God knows you better than you know yourself. He made you. He's sovereign over all your days. And maybe some of you in this room, maybe someone has spoken over you that your life is an accident. Or you somehow, someone told you, well, you're just a mistake. Or your life is a waste. Or maybe you just feel unwanted or unimportant. I want to encourage you today, that is not true. That is a lie. It's not an accident that you're here. God purposed for you to be here. And if you've heard those words spoken over your life, that I pray in the name of Jesus that those words be broken off of you and that you'd hear the truth that you are, are created by God for God to give glory to him. Yeah, amen. Let's give God praise. He's amazing. He's an amazing creator. So your life, your life's not an accident. This is the second one and it's connected. But I want to focus a little more specifically on how you are precious to God. The gospel reveals that you are precious to God. You know, central to the gospel story is the moment when Jesus died on a cross and rose again. Well, why did he do that? I mean, why did God himself, the creator of the universe, die on a cross? Okay, we could get into the whole theology of it, but a simple explanation is love. Because he loves us with the deep, unfailing, sacrificial never-ending, eternal kind of love. And he died, and he took the punishment for our sins, the punishment we deserved. And when he rose again, he conquered death and made a way for us to experience a resurrection life here on earth and in the age to come. I love this quote by Tim Keller. It says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. <laughs> Amazing, hey? We really do need God's grace and forgiveness. And yet, in spite of all our wrongdoing, when he looks at us, he sees people he values and cherishes and cares deeply about. God is not a distant God sitting back, disconnected from humanity. He is intimately involved with those that he created. Think about this in Romans 5, 6. It says, you see... At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? Not when we got our act together, stop sinning, not because we're so perfect, not because we always choose the right thing. But even when we reject God in his ways, he still, in his mercy, extends love and kindness. He demonstrated his love by dying for us. In his book, Soul Cravings, Erwin McManus shares the story about a woman named Kim who he really loved. And he wanted to marry her because he deeply loved her. And he shares the story in the book. Listen to this. He says, I once met a girl named Kim and I fell in love. I pursued her with my love, and I pursued her with my love until my love, I felt my love had captured her heart. So I asked her to be my wife, and she did not say yes. I know, bummer. I was unrelenting <laughs> and asked her again and pursued her with my love and pursued her with my love until she said yes. I did not send my brother to ask her. I did not send a friend. For in issues of love, you must go yourself. God had to come himself to the world. You know, I actually recently got engaged. Yes, exciting. Ah, yay. <laughs> um, it was at Thanksgiving. 
And uh, my fiance Rob does live about two hours away from here. But thankfully, he got down on one knee and asked me in person. He did not send a friend to ask me. <laughs> he did not ask me over a text message or email me or give me a phone call. You know, if he had asked me in those ways and not in person, we would have had to have a serious conversation about etiquette and what it means to show love. But thankfully, he did it in person. And that's why God came, right? He had, he had need to come in person to tell us that he loves us, loves us so much that he died on a cross for us. And this blows my mind too. I mean, the, the love of God, think about this. God doesn't want to just be with us for 50 or 100 years and say, okay, I'm tired of these guys. Let's just throw them into an abyss of nothingness. Like, that's enough. He wants to be with us for ever, all of eternity. Okay, some of you at Christmas, you're hanging out with your family. You're like three hours. I'm, okay, okay, that's good. That's good family time. I'm done for the year or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's not you and your family. Maybe you, you all love each other and that's wonderful. I, I love my family too. I'm sounding like I don't want to spend time with them. But you know what I mean. You know, you've got family time and you're like, okay. But God's not like that. Like he actually wants to be with us forever. He's not looking at his watch going, whew, okay, whew, glad that, that time's over with humanity. He wants to be with us for all eternity. That's an amazing kind of love. That's an enduring kind of love. <laughs> That's a love that it talks about, you know, in Psalm 149, 4, it says, the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. You know, church, God delights in you. You are precious to him. You're extremely valuable, so much so that he would give his very life for you. You're not an accident. You're precious. And this is the third thing that the gospel reveals. The third thing is that we are here on earth for a purpose. There's a reason that you're here. And you know, there's going to be many reasons that people would give to explain why we're here on earth. If you asked someone walking down the street, what do you think your purpose is? Why are you here on earth? Why are you alive? People would give different reasons. Someone might say, well, my, my purpose is to get a good job. You know, I want to make a difference in my community. I want to raise a family. I want to travel the world. Maybe for some people, they want to make lots of money. But, you know, the gospel points to something far greater and more meaningful than any of these. Okay? The gospel points to our purpose in being alive. We were made for a purpose. Do you want to know what it is? You want to know why you're here? It's actually quite simple. If you boil it down to the simplest reason why you are here, it is this. You are here on earth to be loved by God and to love him in return. That is why you're here. You're here to be loved by God and to love him in return. Because you know what? From the overflow of that loving relationship with God, we worship him. We devote our lives to him. We glorify him. We love other people. We build healthy relationships. Everything in our life, all the healthy things in our life flow out of that love relationship that we have with God. Receiving his love and giving him love in return. And you know, the good news of salvation is not just about, you know, someday in the future we get to be with God in a place where there's no pain, no suffering. Salvation is all about, is also about, pardon me, also about here and now. Here and now. I get to have a relationship with the living God now, not someday, not when I get my act together, not when I'm perfect, now, in all my sinfulness, now I get to be loved by him. I get to talk to him anytime I want. He's available 24 hours a day. You're never annoying him or bugging him. You can talk to him anytime. That's amazing. I get to be loved by him right now. I don't have to wait for someday when. Now, today, his love's available for me. I get to grow in my knowledge of him. What a beautiful gift salvation is for here and now and all eternity. Listen to these words from Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. It says, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I'm going to read that again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And with all your strength. That's the greatest thing. Greatest commandment. 
Jesus doesn't say the most important thing for you to do is to get lots of awards or accomplishments or sacrifice millions of dollars to charity or be the most attractive person in the world. Your deepest purpose and calling is simply to be loved by God and to love him in return. Because the world will make it seem like your purpose is something else. You know, when you land that job, finally, I have a sense of purpose. Or when I meet that special someone, finally, I'm significant, I have a, speci- I have a sense of purpose. No. Jesus points to our chief purpose in life is being loved by God. Because, you know what, think about this. Even if in your life everything was stripped away, your health, your job, your family, even if all those things were taken away, if you have air in your lungs, you have a purpose for being here. You're here to be loved by God. Your purpose doesn't change. Season through season, year after year, your purpose remains the same. You're here to be loved and to love him in return. You know, rewind again to uh, when I was 18 and I was searching for purpose and why am I here and wrestling with all that inside my soul. And uh, the, the church that my friend invited me to, they had just started pretty much at that time a book study. Uh, maybe you're familiar with it, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Anyone know, know that book? Yeah. So they just started that book. That's a good book. You should uh, look it up if you haven't read that one. Um, but the book is, you know, over 20 years old now. And uh, I think it's sold, you know, millions of copies, one of the best-selling nonfiction books ever sold. But, you know, for a teenager searching for answers, that book brought so much revelation to my soul. I want you to listen to these words. There's a chapter called What Makes God Smile. Listen to this. This is what God wants most from you, a relationship. It's the most astounding truth in the universe that our creator wants to fellowship with us. God made you to love you, and he longs for you to love him back. God deeply loves you and desires your love in return. He longs for you to know him. He wants to be known by you. He longs for you to know him and spend time with him. This is why learning to love God and be loved by him should be the greatest objective of your life. Nothing else will come close in importance. Do you see it, church? You were made to be loved by him and love him in return. You were created, handcrafted for a relationship with God. It's it's really that simple. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus is that Jesus came to reconcile us with the Father. He came to reconnect us with God. He came so we could experience closeness with our creator. Until you receive God's love and grow in your love for him, you will feel an emptiness in your soul that you will try and fill with other loves. It could be food, entertainment, drugs, work, travel, you name it. Our hearts and our lives were purposed to be in relationship. This is the good news of the gospel. We are loved. We don't have to live aimlessly not knowing why we're here. It's not a big question mark. We have the answer offered by God. We're here to be loved. We're here to love. Now, I want to invite the band uh, to come up with with me at this time. Because we're celebrating something awesome this morning. (laughs) We're celebrating the good news of of Jesus. The gospel is so beautiful. (laughs) What good news to know that we're not here by accident. That is good news. What good news to know that we are loved by God and precious to him. What good news to know that as long as you're here on earth and have breath in your lungs, you have a purpose in being alive. You don't have to go through life aimlessly, not knowing why you're here and wondering if your life even matters. And some of you might wonder that in this room, like, am I even significant? Yes, very much so. Your life matters. The gospel is good news because it shows us just how valuable we are to God. Your life's not an accident. You're precious to God. You're here on earth for a purpose. And that is something to celebrate and get excited about and share with others. That's why we've got good news to share. A lot of people don't know why they're here. They're just going about aimlessly, going day after day, just doing their thing, missing the mark, missing the whole point of why they're here. We need to tell them. But you know, when Jesus shared the good news, he did give people a choice. God will never ever force you to choose him because that's not love, okay? He's not manipulative. 
He's not going to twist your arm and make you choose him or believe in him. But he does extend an invitation. And at church every week, we want to give people an opportunity to make that decision. So church, would you stand with me just now? And, and if you're in this room and something that was shared from God's word really resonates with you, really resonates with you and you think, you know what, I, I don't actually know God. I haven't been put back into right relationship with God, but I want to. I want to know him. Maybe online you're listening and you're thinking, yeah, I want to know God. I want to be loved by him. I want the good news to come alive in my heart. I, I want salvation. I realize I need salvation. I need God's grace. I want to know that I have salvation that will change my life here and now on earth and for all eternity. I want to receive the good news in my heart. Then if that's you, then now's a chance to, to choose. I mean, you don't have to choose now. <laughs> you don't have to. Mine was in my, my bedroom in a, at home. You know, I just made the choice. But we offer this invitation because why wait? <laughs> Take the moment now to actually make that decision and be reconciled to God. Come back to him. He loves you. Even if you don't feel it in your heart, then know it in your mind and then that will drop down. You'll get a revelation. Yeah, God really does love me. He cares about me. Some of you in this room, again, maybe you've, you believe the lie that you don't matter. No one cares. If I, if I left today, it wouldn't matter. That's not true. Your life is precious. There's no replacing you. Your life is precious. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you want to make that decision today, then just simply what we do as a church family, we pray together. We just pray a prayer, and it's a prayer saying, hey, God, I want to know you and be loved by you, and I need your salvation. Come into my heart. Live in my, um, live in my heart. I want to live for you. And even now, you might be feeling a bit nervous about making the choice. Can I encourage you? It is the absolute best choice you will ever make for your entire life. I am so thankful. <laughs> I am so thankful I chose Jesus. I'm so thankful that God saved me. I'm so thankful that I can live a life filled with purpose. So come on, take that invitation now. And if you want to, I just encourage you, if, if you feel comfortable, you can raise your hand and just say, hey, God, me. <laughs> I want to receive that invitation this morning. I want to say yes to you. I'm tired of living life my own way. I'm tired of living my life where I feel purposeless and I don't know why I'm here. I'm raising my hand to say, hey, God, me. I know you notice me, God. I want to live for you. And so come on, church, let's uh, say this together. You can repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your amazing love. I turn away from my sins and I ask for your forgiveness. Please come into my life and give me a fresh start. I trust you and submit to you as my Lord and Savior. I'm now a Christian, a child of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. Help me live my life for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate with those who made that decision here in this room and online? I'm excited for you. <laughs> I'm excited for you. And I pray that the, the gospel would, would really sink into your heart deeply. The, the Bible talks about the word of God being like a seed and our hearts being like soil. And I pray that that seed that you received today would, would fall on good soil in your heart and that you would continue to walk out all that God has for you. He loves you, he sees you, he is for you, and you can celebrate. We celebrate with you in receiving that, uh, receiving salvation, and we celebrate in the good news together, amen. Can we give God some praise as we invite Brian to come back up with some next steps? Thanks, church.